And we will get going. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today at our third Learn with Scholars Portal webinar. My name is Amy Greenberg. I'm just going to do a quick introduction and land acknowledgement, and then we will get started. So before we begin, um, I would just like to acknowledge that the land um, on which uh, both myself and Sabina who will be giving this webinar, um, which we live and work um, for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are certainly very grateful to have the opportunity to live and work um, on this land. Uh, so welcome everyone. As I mentioned, this is our webinar number three in our series, Learn with Scholars Portal. Today, uh, Sabina Pagato will be presenting on usage statistics and web analytics, a deep dive. And um, I'm sure we're all very interested to, um, to hear what she has to say. Sabina is our resident uh, expert. Her portfolio at Scholars Portal includes um, client services and assessment. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. As you can see, this meeting is being recorded. We've also enabled closed captions. If you have uh, any questions about that or about any logistics of the webinar, please pop them in the chat. Um, and myself or someone else from the Scholars Portal team will, um, will address those. Um, the recording and the slides will both be available on the Learn um, the learn.scholars portal website. And I've just put the link to that in the chat. Um, as well, if you'd like to follow along uh, during the presentation today, Sabina has put a link to um, the Google Doc uh, version of her presentation in the chat. So if you'd like to have your own version of the slides as, as she's speaking, you can certainly follow along there. Um, and please, uh, throughout the presentation, feel free to put questions in the chat um, that we can uh, address at various points during the presentation. We, do, we have allotted quite a lot of time for Q&A at the end. Okay, without any further ado, Sabina, take it away. Thanks, Amy. All right, uh, just one second here. Um, so as Amy mentioned, my name is Sabina Pagato and I'm the Client Services and Assessment Librarian at Scholars Portal. So one of the, the kind of intentions of this Learn with Scholars Portal webinar series was to be able to uh, let staff from Scholars Portal share some of the things, uh, the, the more like specialized knowledge that we have. And um, since at Scholars Portal, we're both a library organization, but we also host large content platforms, we have a kind of unique perspective on usage statistics and other kind of online, uh, online assessment metrics, which is a little bit what I am going to talk about today. So um, we're going to start talking a little bit about um, where this sort of fits in with library assessment. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we track web activity and how those activities become statistics. Uh, after that, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can make the most of the web analytics you might be collecting at your own institutions, talking about some of the concerns and limitations of this, and finally wrapping up with questions. So we're actually going to stop the recording before the Q&A period so that you can feel free to ask any kinds of questions uh, that you might want to. So um, I wanted to really start by tying in this, this idea of um, web analytics, usage statistics, and other kind of like online assessment with library assessment as a whole. And so these are three types of evidence. This actually comes from the ISO standard on, uh, on library assessment. So these are the three kind of main types of evidence we use in assessment. The first one is solicited evidence. So that's kind of what you would, what we often think of when we think of library assessment, that's intentional data gathering. So when you're doing a survey, uh, maybe a, a post uh, instruction survey or some kind of interview or focus group. And then there's observational evidence. So that involves uh, directly observing how users interact with a service. So that could be doing, for example, some kind of observational study where you walk through your library and count how many people are uh, reading a book versus on their laptop versus maybe taking a nap. Uh, 
or it could also be something like, uh, for example, reading through transcripts from your online chat reference service to see how many times noise complaints show up. So observational evidence is that you're looking at the way a user interacts with the service, but you're not involving yourself in any way. So you can't, you know, ask some questions about why they're doing things a certain way, and you can only kind of um, gather evidence from your observation. The final kind of evidence is inferred evidence. And this really involves analyzing data that's sort of already being collected for the purposes of uh, running the library services. So usage statistics generally falls pretty squarely into this category. And it could also be things like um, circulation statistics where, you know, you're not tracking the circulation of materials in order to have statistics. You'd need to know what books are going in and out. But the numbers that are sort of generated as a result of that can be read as inferred evidence. So in this ISO standard for library assessment, as I said, they really put that usage statistics and activity logs directly into that inferred evidence category. But I kind of want to question that a bit, because then it kind of makes it seem like that, that, that data that's being collected, because it's being collected by computers and systems, that it's uh, somehow this like perfect immutable data. So I want to question what it would mean to think of it instead as observational evidence where it's the computer doing the observing rather than a person. So it's the computer, a computer or a server is watching how a user interacts with your service and, and reporting back on that rather than thinking of it as something that kind of is automatically collected. So that brings us to the question, what are we counting? And if we're thinking of the computer as, you know, kind of tracking our users as well, what is the computer counting? We kind of know what some of these things look like when we're working in a library. You know, um, a user comes in to the library through uh, the doors and they're captured by a gate count. Maybe in these times of COVID, or maybe if you have extended hours during exam periods, student might actually need to swipe in with their student card to get in. And in that case, you know exactly who has come in and not just that a person has come in. And then there's certain things that a user can do in the library that would involve them showing up in the statistics. Like for example, if they ask a question at the reference desk, they may be tracked in the ref stats. If they um, sign out a book, they might be tracked in the circulation stats. If they use a computer, there might be some kind of stats that are tracked there in terms of how a person uses the library. But we're not actually like planting a tracker on a user when they come in the library and looking at exactly where they're going and what they're doing. That is a little bit of what we can do sometimes with web analytics. It's both more complicated and less complicated than the in-person stats in some way, because we can see a lot of activity that users are doing, uh, and uh, we can't necessarily always map it directly into the same categories that we would with the in-person statistics. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about how these stats are collected, and how we can kind of make meaning of them, what these stats sort of mean in terms of our actual user behavior. So I'm gonna start here by talking uh, specifically about how we track web activity on Scholars Portal journals. And I'm gonna use counter compliance as our example here because counter has some really specific rules about how this activity is tracked and processed and reported. So Scholars Portal Journals is a platform that we host at Scholars Portal. We have over 70 million uh, full text journal articles on this platform, and we produce counter stats. I'm not going to get too deep into counter stats today, but if you're not familiar, um, Project Counter is an organization that produces a code of practice with very specific rules for how to track and report usage of electronic resources, especially journals and ebooks, but other types of uh, statistics as well. So, sorry, I'm just gonna go back for one second to the slide. Um, you can see I have a screenshot here of the Scholars Portal Journals platform. There's a big blue PDF download button. Um, what actually happens when someone clicks that button? Now we're gonna talk about web logging. So when a user performs an action on your website, at the time of that event, 
it can be logged and specific information about that event can be captured. So in this case, if a user clicks that big blue like download PDF button on the Scholars Portal Journals website, um, an event is logged on the Scholars Portal server with exactly what happened that a PDF was downloaded, exactly which article it was, and a little bit of information about the user. That, so that is captured at the time that the action is performed. And this is not something that's inherent in a website. If you just make a simple HTML website and put it on the internet, um, that logging will not happen. Uh, you, that's something that has to be set up in advance. So some of the information that can be captured at the time of that specific event include the nature of the, the event, the exact date and time, the IP address of the user, and other information about the user and about the uh, device that they're using. This, okay, sorry, this turned out grainier <laughs> than it did in my preview. This is what an actual log file looks like when an event gets captured, when a user downloads a PDF on the Scholars Portal Journals platform. So um, you can kind of see here, it's capturing some specific information. I've blocked out the IP address of the user, but it has the exact date and time. Uh, it has some information about the request, the exact article, the fact that it was downloaded in a PDF format, uh, the institution that the user is from, uh, the publication date of the article. And then at the bottom, there's some, some cookies and some other things uh, related to uh, that user's device. So every single time a user performs an action on the Scholars Portal Journals platform, an event like this is logged. And there's even more actual lines in the, the real log event. We've uh, omitted some here to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, but so every single PDF download, every single, uh, basically every single link click, every time someone searches in the menu bar, there's this like long thing of text that's generated and put into the log files. So the log files are A, very ugly, and B, not for human eyes to really look at, but they're necessary in order to create these usage statistics. Um, I wanted to talk about cookies really briefly, and I will come back to this some of this later. Um, but a cookie is a little bit of data that gets saved in your browser while you're browsing a website. And the kind of general purpose of that is that it helps the site maintain some of your activities as you navigate through it or to recognize you when you return later. So you might know sometimes you go to a site and there's that little menu that says, do you want only essential or do you want all cookies? Um, the essential ones really do impact the functioning of the website. One example is on the journals platform, we have a My Articles feature um, where you can click a button to add an article to your list of articles and you can go in and export it later. So this relies on cookies. And if you clear your cookies, all of your articles will disappear from your article list. Um, cookies are often logged at the time of an event and uh, they are frequently used to identify returning users or to kind of track the same user's progress through a website, because that's the main way that you can tie an event to an actual user. We don't actually use that for uh, counter statistics because they're not necessary, but most web analytics programs and things like that um, do use cookies because it is the best way to, to tie these disparate actions that are in your log files together so you know it's all one person doing them. Um, there's also such a thing as third party cookies, which are often come through advertising banners. And those ones are the ones that get a really bad rap for being bad for privacy and being able to track you across multiple sites. Uh, so because of that, some, some users do block those third party cookies and that sometimes involves them blocking the sort of regular cookies as well, um, which has some impacts that I'll talk about uh, later. But I just wanted to mention this in the logging that it can actually um, uh, identify you through those cookies. And that is how it tells, how the site knows that it's the same user who's doing these different actions because each action gets logged discreetly as I, as I showed you. Um, so I have a couple notes about logging. The first one is that you can only log going forward. That means that if you wanna change something about how actions are logged on your site, you can't go backwards and do it. Um, one example about this specifically related to counter is that in the latest version of counter, 
um, they have this um, new metric called investigations. And investigations includes every time that you're looking at a piece of information about an article or a title, um, including you know, clicking on the link to view the alt metrics or clicking on a link to get the link resolver information or um, downloading the uh, supplementary materials. And when we got our copy of the new counter standard, we realized we had to go and change some of our logs because we currently weren't actually logging when someone downloaded supplementary materials that came with the journal. So if there was a supplementary file and a user downloaded it, that just didn't show up in our log files at all, it was just not captured at all. So we were able to set that up as a log event so we can capture that and add it into our investigations for our counter reports. But that means that we could only have those reports going forward from the time that we started logging that activity. We could not go backwards in time to sort of get old data and, and find it because it just wasn't being logged. There's no way for us to know who was downloading those files or if those files were being downloaded at all. Uh, the second note about logs is that logs only show things that happened. As I mentioned, it's like every single action that's taken that you have set up to be logged, obviously, it, it gives you all those strings. Um, but that means that if something didn't happen, it doesn't show up on the logs. And this, this sounds kind of self-evident, but it's really important in terms of looking for things that didn't happen. Like for example, finding zero use titles. If you have a big journal package and you wanna know which titles were not used, it has to be done kind of by a process of elimination. You need to find which titles were used and then kind of subtract that from your, your overall list. And then finally, not everything is always logged perfectly. So um, there are different things that can impact whether something is logged the right way. Um, one example is IP addresses. If somebody is accessing um, your website through uh, a VPN or maybe a proxy server, that is actually uh, has a separate IP address than their actual IP address. It's forwarding their actual IP address but the log may or may not be picking up what their actual IP address is. So it might um, kind of shift uh, what, what, uh, what you think is happening with your logs. Okay, so now we have our log files. They are massive because every single event that happened has you know, those bajillion lines in that file. Now we need to process them to turn them into actual data from raw data into aggregate data. So moving those individual events into a total. At Scholars Portal Journals, there's a script that we run once a month. It goes into those files and it finds every single one of those log events that has like a PDF download or an HTML full text access for each school and for each ISSN. And it pulls that information and a little bit of information about the user and a little bit of information about the year of publication and it adds it all together and runs some processing scripts to identify whether it's a new user or a unique user. And then it spits out for each journal, for each institution, how many uh, total requests or full text accesses and unique requests or full text accesses. So that's the same user uh, downloading the same article more than once will count as uh, one unique one, because same article, same user. For each, uh, so for each school, for each journal, for each uh, year of publication, because that is required for counter. And it will spit all that out into a database that we can then um, use to create actual reports. Um, it also runs various things that counter requires in terms of processing. So for example, um, we discount any double clicks. So if the same, user is clicking on the same link twice within 30 seconds, it's counted as a double click. So we ignore the second, the first click and we only go with the second click. Uh, we also filter out any bot traffic and counter maintains a list of bots to be filtered out. And um, yeah, this is also where you merge together the different types of log events into the metrics you need. So as I mentioned, in terms of those requests, which is a full text access, we merged together the PDF downloads and the HTML accesses into one metric for requests. 
or investigations, which is the counter metric that includes any kind of information that you may be getting uh, about an article, then we would merge together a supplementary, a download of supplementary materials or uh, viewing the altmetrics link or uh, clicking on the DOI to go to the publisher website, all these different things that could be counted as investigations. And there's a, a pretty lengthy list of that in the counter standard itself. Uh, we merge them together into the one metric called investigations. Processing is also where you would include additional information, for example, translating an IP address into a location. Now that you've processed all your data into actual data, then there comes the question of reporting and how frequently to report. Um, so one main thing to consider when you're thinking about this is the, the time range. Counter, for example, has monthly reports. You cannot break the data down into anything more granular than a month. But depending on the site, uh, you may want to be able to break it down more granularly. So that's something to consider. Uh, and then the metrics. So Counter has very specific rules about which metrics to report in which of their reports. The final very important thing in terms of reporting is format. So often we want something that can be easily ingested into another tool like a TSV or CSV format. If you have a broader analytics tool, um, you, can, you can use that to ingest reports from a specific site into or um, maybe if you're using something like Tableau for visualizations, a TSV or a CSV can be used for that as well. Um, or if what you really want is something to show to other people so that you can actually look at it and understand the data just by looking at it, then a chart, a heat map, even just a table um, can be a good way to report. So I wanted to just mention a few caveats on the usage of counter. Um, as kind of indicated, counter has these very specific rules for how to process this data and how to report this data. And that involves taking different kind of functions that could be happening with it on with content on your site and transforming it into uh, one single metric of say investigations. So this is intentional on Counter's part. They want to be able to make things as comparable as possible between publishers, between platforms, um, between uh, publications, uh, regardless of any kind of features or special things that might be on that platform. So Counter is really great for that comparison. It's pretty much the only game in town. And it's also really helpful for um, content types that have a pretty standard method of usage. So journals, for example, we pretty much all are looking at um, a full text article access is kind of the most important thing. And that's captured perfectly in counter or even eBooks. Um, there's a fairly standard way of, of using it. So counter is great. But because counter does sort of flatten out those differences between platforms, if you're assessing a platform with kind of unique built in features, or content that's really tied into the features of the platform, or maybe um, a more complex content type, then it might be helpful to consider which uh, statistics that the, the provider themselves are tracking rather than counter statistics. I think because counter has such a great reputation for having these high quality statistics for, for journals, especially in, in eBooks, um, sometimes we think that they're the only game in town. So I've, I've heard people ask, oh, can we get counter stats for this or that? And the other thing, it's like, well, maybe you could, but it wouldn't necessarily tell you that much useful if you're looking at, for example, um, a, a tool that has data sets, but it also has a visualization tool built into the platform. Counter can tell you which data sets were accessed, but it won't tell you a lot about whether the visualization tool was used or if it was downloaded, what kinds of formats it was downloaded in or other kinds of things you might have questions about. So I just wanted to note that here. So now that we have kind of like a, a very basic introduction to how activity on the web is tracked and transformed into data. I wanted to talk a little bit about web, web analytics and how you can sort of use your web analytics for your website to your uh, advantage. And we're gonna use uh, Matomo as an example. This is the usage statistics tool that we use at Scholars Portal. 
Um, there are a lot of different analytics tools and they kind of do very similar things. Google Analytics is probably the most popular and most well-known. Um, we use Matomo as Scholar's Portal. It formerly used to be called um, Puik. This is an open source tool and we are able to host it on our own servers, um, which means that all of the data that is collected is only on our servers and we can be very um, um, protective of that, of that data and confident in its safety and security. So web analytics all kind of work the same way. Um, there's some kind of code, usually some kind of JavaScript code that you copy and paste into all of the pages on your website, or if you're using a content management system, you might only need to enter it once and it will automatically be on all the pages of your website. And then when the page loads, when a user visits it, it captures certain things about that user and their visit. So a few things, excuse me, that it commonly captures are the IP address, and that can be broken down to tell you the location as well as the internet service provider of that user. The user agent, which gives you information about the user's device and the browser that they're using. Uh, the referrer, which put a little asterisk there. Uh, the referrer tells you which site the user was on before coming to your site. Um, but that is not always a perfect uh, metric. And then using a combination of you know, the actions of loading a page, for example, and um, the cookies that can be tracked so that you know which user is which, it can also tell you the time that users spend on a page or on a site, which pages they viewed, how they navigated through the site, um, and their entry and exit page, the first page that the user lands on and the last page the user is on before they leave the site and also whether it's a returning or new visitor. Um, so as I said, those are dependent on cookies. So somebody who is clearing their cookies frequently, that's not necessarily going to show up the same way. Um, here's an example of a dashboard uh, in our Matomo implementation. And this is sort of a default uh, dashboard. If you have uh, a web analytics tool, you can sort of create your own with the charts and the metrics that are most useful to you. But this just kind of gives you a sense of the kind of information that is collected. So you can see there's maps that show you where users are coming from. There's a little chart showing visits over time. Uh, there's um, a table showing the channel types, so that's where people are coming from. Uh, but what I actually want to draw your attention to is on the left, there is a table called a section called visits in real time. And this actually shows the individual visitor log because this is in real time, this is updating live and this is data that hasn't gone through that sort of processing yet. So this is really raw data of a user's visit. And one of the reasons that I didn't want to do a live demo of Matomo is that um, if you accidentally, if I accidentally were to hover over one of the icons on that side, I might accidentally give you a lot more information than I want to about users visiting our site. So you can see on the top there, it says Monday, January 24th, and there's a little icon of a person with an arrow that means it's a returning visitor. And um, if I hovered over it, it would give me more information about, about the visitor. They're coming from Canada, they're using Chrome, on a Windows machine, uh, it's a, a either a laptop or desktop computer, not a mobile device. And if I if I clicked on any one of those icons, it would give me a lot more information about that user, um, their exact IP address, the city that they're in, their internet service provider, the version of Chrome they're using, the version of Windows they're on, and um, what their previous visits were. You can also see that there's the little actions button below in a little folder. That means that they've downloaded a file on our site. Um, so, as you can see, these web analytics can give you very detailed information about individuals who are visiting your website. It is frequently, well, okay, it's a little creepy, but also it's not particularly helpful in the grand scheme of things to know what an individual person is doing on your website. Um, if you really want to know how an individual is navigating your website, then it's probably better to do some kind of UX study where they're in a UX lab and they can talk you through what they're doing as they're doing it. Because with this, you can only kind of guess at what they're what they're doing and why they're navigating in a certain way. So um, 
this information is there and it's important to know that it's there and to be aware that this information is there. Um, but it's actually not helpful in terms of library assessment or in terms of understanding the use of your website. The aggregate data is much more helpful and much more interesting in those regards. So I wanted to talk about a few things um, that you can do within your web analytics tool to sort of um, make the most out of it. And the first thing is event tracking. So kind of out of the box, a web analytics tool will track whether a page was loaded. And there's a couple other things it might do out of the box or with really minimal configuration. Um, but anything more than that is, is not really present because every page is different and the kinds of actions that might be available on that page are different. So if you really want to understand what people are doing on your page and add context to them, you have to set up this event tracking. And this is a logging feature. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, if you have a question like, oh, I wonder how many people are downloading, you know, our the PDF version of our uh, citation guide, you can't like go backwards and answer that. You have to set up your event tracking in advance. Um, so a few things that you might want to set up as event tracking are page interactions. So what kinds of things people are clicking on on your page, um, non-page links. So the, the analytics can track navigation through your website, but if you have a link to say an email address or even a link to your social media page, it may not be able to track that as well. And then screen interactions. So how far people down are scrolling, for example. Now, I would say with these um, to decide which things you have the most questions about or that you want to know about in advance when you set up this event tracking and don't kind of go hog wild and, and set up event tracking for every possible thing that you could on your site, um, because it can get a little intense if you have too many different categories. Here's an example. Uh, this is from the Scholars Geo Portal. Um, so we have a bunch of different events set up for different types of actions that can be done on the Scholars Geo Portal. It's a visualization tool. So there's you know, a, a map there and then you can add different data layers to the, the map. So you can see there's layers add and layers remove are on there. There's different types of downloads that are possible. And um, I, I, one other recommendation, I would suggest that if you're gonna do something like this, you should document what you have called your different events quite well, um, because some of these names are a little bit more intuitive than others. We also have tracking for certain types of errors, so we can see how often these errors are happening um, on our site. And um, if you click through to the other sections in this on this page, so event actions and event names, you can see with detail which data sets this applies to. So how many data sets were involved in that download output event, for example. So this can give you a lot of information on how your website is being used. Uh, another really helpful section is um, campaigns. And this can kind of sound a little bit scary, like a marketing campaign can kind of sound a little bit businessy, um, but it's not invasive at all. Uh, basically, it lets you track more stuff involved with the referral section of the analytics. So how people are getting to your content. And the main way that this is useful is in emails. So that refer section where it tells you what page people were or what site people were on before they came to your um, website, um, that actually, not to get too into the weeds of technical details, it relies on uh, the HTTP protocol has passing along that refer. And so if you're in something that doesn't use HTTP, for example, an email program, it's not going to pass along any refer. Anyone who's coming to you from an email program, it's going to show up like a direct entry visit. Like this is the first website that they've been on today, basically. So adding campaigns to your emails um, lets you track whether people are clicking links from emails you send or maybe embedded in documents or things like that. And it, it really is basically just a little um, addition that you put on the end of different links so you can tell which link a person used to get to you. So you might use a different uh, little slug on uh, the link that you're sending out to one group versus another group, for example, or at different times. 
So here's an example of uh, what we have done at Scholars Portal. Um, on uh, the left, you can see this is our general referrals section. So you can see most people are coming from either direct entry or websites and some from search engines. There's a little slice for campaigns. And those for us are all email newsletters. So if we didn't have that campaigns button, all of those would show up as being in direct entry because anyone coming from email will show up as a direct entry. On the right, you can see how it's actually broken down. Um, we have a few different newsletters. We have um, a weird string that uh, somehow got strange in encoding. So you can see how many people are, are coming to our site from these different newsletters. And that's really helpful for us. Um, I should mention uh, campaigns are another thing that are logging related. So that gets logged when a person enters your website, what link they use to get there. Um, so if you um, if you want to know, you have to set that up in advance, much like the event tracking I was talking about earlier. Uh, another thing that is uh, can be really helpful to make most out of your web analytics is to create segments. And this is where you can split out specific types of visitors to see if their usage is different or um, if you have questions about their experience on, on your website. Um, and this one is actually processing related. So you can go backwards and reprocess old data. If you define a segment, it normally takes a few hours, maybe a day for that data to process that you can actually view it. But that means that you don't need to decide upfront, um, you know, which, which kind of kinds of visitors you're interested in. So um, a few examples of what you can do are visit based segments. So you can create a segment based on whether someone's a first time or a returning user very easily, but also based on things like um, what page they landed on first, um, their, their kind of entry page into the site. Interaction based segments. So that's if you have events, uh, event tracking set up on your website, you can say that you want um, a segment of people who did a specific event, like maybe a segment of people who registered for a workshop and, and see other things they've done on your site, for example or maybe a segment of people who have logged in to the library, uh, their library accounts that you know that those are definitely patrons of your library and not sort of other community visitors who might be on your website for another reason. Uh, demographic segments are on here and that is the definition directly from Matomo. And it, it can sound a little bit um, uh, invasive again, but it's basically not that accurate. The demographic segments here are really looking at location. So that's coming from your IP address, kind of where you're coming from in the world, uh, and also uh, browser language. So that could be really interesting in terms of looking at your users who are in the same city as you or who are uh, elsewhere, but maybe within Ontario or within Canada, or people who are accessing your website from another country entirely. And you can also think about that browser language now, not everyone has their browser language set to the, their actual um, mother tongue or language that they're speaking all the time, but it could be helpful in terms of looking at maybe creating a segment for people whose browser languages are English or French or neither to maybe get a sense of um, international students and how they're using your website. Uh, there's also technographic segments. So that would be uh, looking at what kind of device or browser that uh, the users are, are using. So. Uh, are mobile users having a different experience than uh, someone who's uh, using a laptop or Windows versus Mac or uh, Apple versus Android, or um, you know, maybe people who are using a really old version of a browser. Um, that's all captured in the user agent when someone uh, accesses your site. So uh, that's something that you can, can determine in technographic segments. It's quite easy to set these up. It's basically any variable you can think of and uh, using basic Boolean logic if you wanna create um, a uh, more complicated segment. So we have one that I have, well, we have several, but one that I have here on this page to show you is users who are coming from Canada, but outside of Ontario. So other provinces in Canada and um, I neglected to include the slide shot of just Ontario, but this is for our learn site, which it has all of our user guides for our services. And if you look at just the ones inside Ontario, 
one of the most popular pages is the page that tells you how to register for a racer account at each institution. Uh, but obviously that's only going to be relevant to people who are at an Ontario institution. Unsurprisingly, if you look at Canada outside of Ontario, the most popular page is for um, the Dataverse service, which is one that is available not just in Ontario, but to all of Canada. So these can be helpful in terms of um, looking at different user groups, how they're using your website, which pages are most popular, that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of visualization options. Um, generally, tables and charts are the default, and these are the easiest on human eyes. For most of these sorts of uh, web analytics tools, you can export CSV or TSV files uh, for further analysis or for inputting into um, maybe if you have a business insights tool on campus or maybe um, a sort of more broad analytics tool. And uh, sometimes some of these services also have APIs so that you can actually feed data directly from the server itself into something um, like a business insights tool. Um, Matomo, for example, has an API where you can have certain reports pulled regularly. Um, there's a lot of built-in options to change the visual visualization within the tool itself as well. And um, certain features like being able to do overlays of like where on this page, where are people actually clicking or heat maps of where people are clicking the most. One of the things that I find the most useful is this uh, transitions view, which actually shows you traffic throughout the site. So for the page that you're on, on your website, where were people coming from to get to that page and where did people go after that page? So that can give you um, a really great indication of how people are moving through your site or um, what people are doing, maybe even identifying areas um, where people are kind of hitting roadblocks. All right, just gonna pause for one second. So um, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of information that's being tracked about individual users and a lot of ability to kind of follow individual users through, the, through your website. And um, that is a big concern for a lot of people. We do capture IP addresses and other potentially sensitive information you can literally, if you want, track a user through their entire journey of your website or if they come back to your website, different things like that. Um, as I said, it's not necessarily helpful to, for us to do that, but it's there and that means that we need to be concerned about it. So it's important to consider who has access to this data. And not just in terms of, you know, whether you're using uh, Google Analytics or some other analytics uh, big analytics company, and then you have to worry about, you know, your data on their service or whatever, but also internally, who actually has an account, who can view this data? Um, is it just your website administrators? Is it anyone who has edit access to your website? Is it anyone in the library at all? And under what conditions can they access it? Is it like maybe uh, the webmasters can pull reports with the aggregate data to share with everyone, but not everyone can, can go in and actually see individual user IP addresses, um, that kind of thing. Uh, it's important to think about that and have a policy about that um, if you don't already. And again, with how the data is being used or reported. And sometimes users uh, have some awareness that, that their actions are being tracked. That doesn't necessarily mean they want to be reminded of it. You know, there was a situation, I think it was uh, Netflix tweeted something about like, to the person who watched, you know, this movie 20 times in a row, are you okay? And people were really freaked out at the idea that, you know, A, Netflix can see that, which I mean, obviously, of course, they can see that, but B, that they're like reminding you they can see that, that enough people saw that this one person's viewing activity that their social media in turn was aware of it. So um, even if you do notice something unusual with a specific user that you do want to follow up on, uh, it's really important to, to be aware of that um, 
that privacy element and uh, just kind of be sensitive to, to users themselves. I also want to talk a little bit about accuracy. So the first thing I want to say is in terms of referrals, I would be very suspicious of that direct entry count. Um, that relies on the HTTP protocol passing on what website the user was on before they came to your website. And not, not only does that not include, you know, people coming from email, but it also doesn't include, um, so for some people might have like do not track settings or other um, uh, privacy settings, or uh, the sites themselves may not pass along that information. I was in a meeting once with a, a vendor, uh, a large publisher, who was saying that um, something like 50% of their traffic was coming from direct entry and how great was that, that everyone had their website bookmarked or was um, you know, typing in you know, x, xyzuniversitypress.com to access their, their traffic directly. And I was sitting there like, that's not true. There are, 50% of your traffic is not coming from people who have memorized your URL or bookmarked you. In fact, if someone is uh, logging into through um, Shibboleth or a proxy server between your discovery layer and the uh, site themselves with the online resources, often those authentication sites are not actually passing through that data. So it will show up as a direct entry because for security reasons, that site that they're logging into is not passing on the referrer um, to the, the next site. Um, so I would be very suspicious of that uh, direct entry count. Um, unique and returning visitors. Once again, this can be impacted by people's privacy settings. If people have do not track settings or are clearing their cookies very frequently, um, or just people who are using multiple devices. Um, so just be aware that those numbers are not perfect and they're coming from these specific things. They're coming generally from cookies. And so um, knowing where, where that number is coming from, where that determination is coming from can help you kind of um, identify how you know, seriously you wanna take those final numbers. Um, also, in terms of looking at location, uh, depending on how your analytics are set up, it may or may not be able to determine the true IP address if somebody is using a VPN or um, a proxy server. So you may be seeing that a lot of your traffic is coming from on campus and you're a little confused because your campus is closed and it might actually be people using a VPN if your uh, analytics are set up to only capture this kind of first IP address and not the forwarded IP address. Um, search engines also, um, one fun thing in Google Analytics is that if someone is not signed in to a Google account and they use Google to find your site, it will tell you what keywords they searched for, which can be fascinating. But if somebody is signed into their Google account, it actually won't show you their keywords. It'll show up as keyword not defined or like a private keyword or something like that. So, I mean, that's probably good in terms of user privacy for those Google users, but it means that uh, you don't necessarily know how people are finding, finding your website. So once again, don't rely 100% on some of these things. Um, that is about all I wanted to talk about today. I know that's a lot of information. Some of it was pretty technical, but I sort of wanted to make sure that we are thinking in, in a, a thoughtful manner about these statistics and not assume that because they're being automatically gathered by a computer, there's some kind of perfect and uh, immutable standard. Every statistic that we gather, whether it's you know you as a person, writing down every time somebody asks a reference question at the desk or a computer flagging every time someone clicks a PDF download button, it's all relative and it's important to understand the nuance and to approach, uh, approach all of our statistics with a certain level of thoughtfulness. So, um, yeah, just important to remember that every statistic is a summary of individual actions and 
um, to treat online statistics with the same thoughtfulness that you would treat more, more traditional library metrics. I have a few resources here. Uh, so the most recent version of the counter code of practice, if you're interested, uh, there's also some very lengthy technical documentation available on the counter website about how very specifically things are tracked and processed. There are several ISO standards related to library statistics assessment and performance indicators, and I also have a link to the uh, documentation uh, for Matomo for setting up all those different kinds of uh, special features in the analytics that I talked about. So that's all that I have today. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording in a second and uh, take your questions. And uh, if you have additional questions, you can always email me or find me on Twitter. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. So. Great. Thank you, Sabina. 